Hey everybody, what's up? I had a really good question from a patron who said basically that he's an investment advisor and he has some clients who are interested in collectibles and he's kind of steering them towards TCG stuff. And he asked my opinion on it and what kind of products. He gave some suggestions of things he was thinking about. And, you know, I answered him initially and then I've been thinking about it for a couple more days and I thought, this is pretty applicable to maybe a lot of you who might want to park more than just a small amount of money into cards. And as I thought more and more about it, my thoughts became much more structured and, and refined. And, and I thought, okay, it's probably time to make a video about this. So the big things I thought were basically anything you, ne you recommend needs uh, verifiability, portability, and protectability. And so verifiability, basically, you want graded stuff. Um, you don't want to mess with raw cards, or to the extent that you have raw cards, you want to get them graded. Because essentially, if it's a very high quality copy of something and you get it graded, it increases the value because then it's authenticated and it's protected. Um, Portability comes down to how much value can you cram into a certain volume of space or into a certain weight. And obviously, you know, Rudy has talked in the past that at least at one time, I have no idea now, but at one time he had like two or three different locations he was storing sealed product at. And, you know, if, if a, a giant tidal wave was coming to Florida, there's no way he could get anything out of the way right? It would all be stuck because there's just so much mass and volume of product that he's got sitting around. And that's not something you want to, that's not a problem you want to have if you're just looking for investment. Now, obviously, Rudy is doing it as a business and not simply for personal investment. And then protectability, that comes back to having graded cards, having them uh, in the slab. And protectability goes hand in hand with portability because you can take them with you if you need to go somewhere, you know, if you live in a hurricane prone area or a wildfire prone area or something like that. And as I was thinking about it, what I realized is probably the only thing I would recommend is graded magic reserve list. And I know that sounds kind of silly to say that's the only thing. Yes, there are tons of products that have a lot of value. There are tons of products that we expect to appreciate well in time. But if you're simply looking to store value and do it conveniently in a very high quality asset that is collectible related, that's probably the place you want to look. Now, obviously, a sealed product might be a good suggestion, but we all saw Logan Paul's fake Pokemon first edition box that was full of G.I. Joe cards. We saw how Baseball Card Exchange was willing to authenticate a box that they had no business authenticating. And... Essentially, I guess the details of that are still falling out, figuring out if it can be determined where along the line that was the fake box was inserted, where the first person who didn't actually know it was fake came along and bought it. Also, when it comes to things like old classic Pokemon cards, even if they are graded, even if they are high grade, there are some issues with very, very nuanced variations of them. And there's a guy on YouTube named Rattle Pokemon who does uh, some videos about that from time to time. He'll find things where people are selling graded Pokemon cards that claim to be one very expensive variant, but are actually a much less expensive variant. They aren't cheap, but they're much less expensive. And it appears what happens in these cases is that somebody who understands the difference and understands that they have in their possession a card that's worth maybe 10% of what a very rare variant would be worth, sends it into PSA, claiming that it's an expensive variant. And then the experts at PSA simply don't know enough. They say, yeah, it looks fine. They grade it, slab it, they mark it as the really expensive variant. And then the person tries to sell it as the expensive knockoff because PSA has authenticated it. So that's kind of an issue that Pokemon has unique to it that Magic doesn't really have. Magic didn't have a bunch of variants of cards. They had some different artwork versions in Alliances, Homelands, uh, maybe Ice Age, that kind of era. And then they started doing foil cards in uh, Urza's Legacy. 
So up until then, they really didn't have problems with that kind of thing. So you would avoid that if you just stayed with reserve list cards. Um, also, there's this very narrow window where uh, Urza's Legacy came along and they started making foil cards. And then the very next set was Urza's Destiny, which was the end of reserve list cards. And so between Urza's Legacy and Urza's Destiny, there are 23 foil reserve list cards. So that's like this really special time when you could get foil and reserve list together. So that's something you'd want to focus on. But my advice would be uh, buy very good, high quality copies, raw copies of cards. Pick a grading house, either PSA or BGS. Don't mess with anyone else. Just use that one grading house. And then you will get a feel for what a raw card will grade into over time as you grade more and more cards, as you send them off and then you get them back and you see how they grade. You'll, you'll start to get a feel for what a potential raw card could grade into. Then you have to decide things like, what kind of price am I willing to spend per card? And, you know, that's, a, that's an issue. If, if you want to put $500,000 into graded reserve lists, that's a much different answer to that question than if you just want to put $5,000 into graded reserve list cards. And so you have to decide, if, if you want to put a half a million dollars into them, you need to start looking at things like lotuses and moxes and uh, definitely dual lands. But dual lands are certainly within uh, the budget of most people. And so you just need to decide those kind of things. And really, it may not be a bad idea to uh, go across a large spectrum of prices. But I thought it was a really interesting question because it would seem that there's a lot of things worth investing in, but as I thought about it more and more, I kept pairing other things off the list. And another good example of ones that I cut off the list was classic old magic cards that just are not reserve lists. And a good example of this would be Demonic Tutor. You know, Demonic Tutor is not reserve list. It was reprinted I believe most recently in Strixhaven last year as a Mystical Archive card, and it dates all the way back to Alpha. But it is not one that I would invest in. I would buy it because I like the card, but I, for strictly investment, I would not buy it. And the reason is, WotC will continue to reprint it in the future. It will never be as special as reserve list cards. And because it will have the uh, pressure from players who want copies of it to play with alleviated by reprints, its price appreciation over long periods of time just will not be as high as reserve list cards, especially playable reserve, reserve list cards. And that gets into another topic, which is, you know, if you can find reserve list cards that are popular in Commander, then I believe Time Twister is a, a good example of that. I think that's the one. Um, those will definitely have additional pressure on them over time for appreciation. So basically those were my thoughts about it. I thought it was a really interesting question and it really got me thinking about how would you define a great asset for somebody who maybe is not interested in the nostalgic part of having TCG cards or boxes or, or whatever assets but simply wants to do it for pure investment. And we have to keep that in mind. We love this stuff because we are nostalgic. And we also make different decisions, not only because of our nostalgia, but because maybe we're running businesses. And so we will buy things that a pure heartless investor may not buy, or an investor who also loves magic and loves playing games may not buy. So you may buy things just because you're operating as a business. Obviously, we see Rudy do that all the time when, uh, you know, he buys pallets and pallets of standard magic draft boxes, you know. Um, so let me know what you think, anything you disagree with, things you think I might have missed, or good points that you think you could add to this discussion. Let me know. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Join me on Final Trade. Thanks a lot, guys.